2 Timothy 4, verses 1. And it says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will Keep up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me only, but not only to me only, but also to those all who have loved His appearing. Let's pray this morning. So, Heavenly Father, we, Lord, we pause for a moment and we, Lord, we consider, Lord, who You are. Your Word instructs us to be still and to know that you are God. Lord, that it's you that has given us your word, that we may study it, that we may understand what your will is, that we may understand who you are. So Lord, as we uh, give attention to your word this morning, we ask that you would speak. Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and show us, God, what it is that you are calling us to, what it is that you want us to put our hope and our trust in this morning. Lord, we just don't want knowledge and information, but Lord, we want transformation, and this is only a work that your Spirit can do in us. And Lord, so we petition you, and we ask that you would come and speak to us this morning. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're just jumping in with us this morning, we uh, have been going through the The book of 2 Timothy, we took a few weeks that we paused for a moment as we prepared for Easter, and now we are here uh, approaching the end of of 2 Timothy. And it's been such a a rich um, letter that that we see as Paul, and such heartfelt letter that as Paul is writing to Timothy. Now we are here in the end of of 2 Timothy, and it is the end of, of Paul's life. The end of Paul's life is at hand. You can see it in everything, how he is writing to to Timothy. Everything in this last chapter is evident that that what he is now focusing on and what he wants Timothy to know is something that is is absolutely important for his ministry. Some believe that that, that as Paul is writing here, that it, it could be actually within months or weeks or even days that that Paul is about to give his life and he will become a martyr for Jesus as his head is, is taken off and martyred him. Paul is, is speaking here and he's reminding Timothy of, of this solemn charge that he wants Timothy to know and it's the, the solemn charge of, of proclaiming God's Word. In our text today, Paul preaches... Paul t- charges Timothy to, to preach the word. Whether the time was convenient or whether the time was, was inconvenient for him. But Timothy was to be about proclaiming the, the truth of, of God's word. Our big idea today is, is to fulfill our ministry. We need God's word preached and to be ever before our minds, our hearts and minds. To fulfill our ministry, we need God's Word preached and to be ever before our our minds and hearts. We're going to look at this this morning as lessons on how to fulfill your ministry. Lessons on how to fulfill your ministry. The first lesson is living before the, the presence of God and King Jesus. 
Secondly, be ready to proclaim God's word. Don't turn away from the truth and and be faithful to the end. Two weeks ago, we looked at the the authority of, of God's word. How it means, how it is the means for us to to grow spiritually. It is the necessity that that the the Christian and the the believer in Jesus and the follower of Christ is to have a a daily intake of God's word and to to be reminded of of the truth of God and to to hold on to it and to to stand upon the promises of God. So many people are wanting a, a word from God and they're seeking all these different means to to be able to find someone to give them a word of God. And we don't have to look any further than the the Scripture. When we we open up God's word, we have God's inspired word that God has given to us. We learned a couple weeks ago that God's word is is inspired by God, which means that it's it's God-breathed. That everything in the original text is, is from God, that God inspired it that what we read in scripture and what we hold on to is is truth and in fact this truth there's nothing that is like it in this world it's greater than the newspaper it's greater than than any information any book that you can pick up this book actually reads you when you open it up if you have been a believer for a while and if you've studied God's word that you know that as, as we saw, as we've been studying the second Timothy, that we've saw that, that God's word is like a mirror. When we pick it up, we begin to read it all of, all of a sudden, all, all of a sudden God begins by his spirit to, to speak into our hearts. He begins to expose the, the errors in our ways. He begins to show us the things in our life that are, are contrary to his word. That we have in return to either respond to that truth, either to to repent, to turn to God and to receive His way, or we can go on in our own way. And we find ourselves in maybe a place of of deception, in in a place of maybe walking in our own thinking or walking in the world's ways compared to walking in God's truth. But what we have in God's Word is is God's Word, that God has given it to us, that He's preserved it for us, that in fact people have have given their lives for the word of God, that it could be preserved and that we could have it in our, maybe some of us have a few copies of it in our our house. But never underestimate the the word of God and and its power to to change our lives and its power to, to open up the path of God and show us the way that we should go. God's word is is inerrant, it's infallible. And here at Redemption Calvary, we we hold to a a high view of God's word. When we read it, when we open up our heart to it, God prepares us for every good work. That he makes us complete, that he makes us mature as we hold on to it and as we meditate on it and as we apply it to our lives. We must, as we continue in 2 Timothy 4, must recognize that that everything that Paul is urging Timothy in is in the light of this. So we turn our our attention to 2 Timothy 4.1 as we look at the lessons on, on how to fulfill your ministry. The first, living before the presence of God and in King Jesus. Look at verse 1. I charge you therefore before God... And the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. This is all speaking of the the seriousness of the charge that Paul is about to give Timothy. what What he is calling Timothy to and what he is wanting Timothy to have at the forefront of his mind is this truth of the reality of of living before the presence of God, that as Timothy has been called to this task, as Timothy has been uh, called out from from God and anointed and placed in this position of as a pastor to to the church of Ephesus, 
That he's, he's to be reminded of, of living in, before the presence of God and, and King Jesus. The word charge in, in Greek can mean to, to testify under oath. Paul wants Timothy to understand the, that this spiritual aspect, that his ministry was above all before the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, That this was ultimately who Timothy was to be accountable to. And it was vital for him to understand this aspect. 1984 in Scotland, Billy Graham was was visiting Britain on one Sunday morning. He preached in a church where the queen was attending the worship service. And that afternoon, a a reporter asked him, What was it like to preach in the presence of the queen? And Billy Graham wisely said, Every time I preach, I'm in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That he understood the the fact and the reality of that his ministry was before God. That above everything else, that God was watching, that God was aware of, of everything that he was doing. And it's the same light that, that Paul is, is calling Timothy and he's urging him solemnly to understand the, the reality of, of what his calling is. And it's before God that he was to fulfill his calling. As a servant of Jesus Christ, this is, this is what we must realize. That we must keep ever before us. That we serve before the presence of, of Jesus. That above everything else and above every and among everyone else, that it's Christ that should be our, our motivation. It's before Jesus that we should want to serve and we should want to do everything not as unto man, but as unto God and as unto Jesus. He is the one in, to whom we should desire to please and desire to, to delight. It's Him that we should live for and Him that we should worship. Psalm 16 and 8 says, I have have set the Lord always before me. Because He is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. There's a psalm of David, and David here is is making a a conscious decision. He's making a conscious decision here that, that God would be the focus and in his mind in everything that he did. What does it look like? It's, it's us starting our day. It's reminding ourselves. It's going to God in prayer and saying, God, I, I need your help. That everything that I am to do today, that God, I want you involved in it. I'm pl- actively and consciously placing God before everything that we do in life. That even your job that you go to and you work, you know, you work throughout the week and you have a boss and you do all these things. But it's reminding ourselves that that actually we're actually doing everything before God. That God is seeing our hearts, that God is watching us. And there's something about when we have this in our mind and in our heart that that encourages us to to serve God with with joy, encourages us to serve God with with a, a sober and a right motive and a right heart. As Timothy was being solemnly urged here, he was to remember that that his ministry was before the Lord. Jesus is the the true judge. I think it says in verse 1 that who will judge the living and the dead. What a powerful statement if you you think about that. It's, It's Jesus that will one day judge the living and the dead. It is Jesus who will reward all those who have loved him and who are looking for him to come back. It was Paul who was here at the end of his life. And this was actually what was his motivation and what he was calling Timothy to hold into his mind. That he was wanting Timothy to to keep this ever before him. Edmund Hybert says this, the the words shall judge more literally are, is about to be judging. 
They point to the fact that Paul was living in the hope of the imminent return of Christ. There's something that is convicting, something that is sobering when we realize that, that Christ could come at any moment. That Christ could return and so how should we live and how should we think and what should we do with our life and if we realize that each and every one of us has been called to, to something. that God has given us and entrusted us a ministry. Maybe your ministry may not look like it's a ministry like this behind the pulpit but each and every one of us has, has been given an assignment from God. That God is, as Jesus was ascending into heaven, he gave his disciples and said that all authority has been given to me. And he, he gave them the great commission to go out into all the world and to, to preach the gospel. And to make disciples and baptizing them in, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each one of us has this purpose to proclaim the gospel. But each one of us has a different assignment Maybe your assignment might look differently. Maybe it might be in, in, a, in a hospital. Maybe it might be in a mechanic shop. Whatever it is that God has entrusted to you that, that we're to, to keep in the back of our minds and our hearts and to keep it ever before us that, that we do what we do before the presence of God. As followers of, of Jesus, that we're to, we're to remind ourselves that we're, we're pilgrims here on this earth. And in fact, that those who, are, who have been saved and those who have been born again are, are actually citizens of heaven. And they realize that, that Christ is, is going to return. And we should live for Him and we should be evident in the way that we serve the Lord. Knowing that, that He is ruling and that He is watching, that He is, is going to return for His church. So the second lesson is, first, we live before the presence of God and King Jesus. And secondly, be ready to proclaim the God, be ready to proclaim the God's word. Look at verse two. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. What was Timothy to do, he was to, to preach the word. We may get the, the idea of a, a preacher of being behind a stage and someone who is behind a pulpit, and, and it definitely does include that, but more, more so it, it, it means to, to proclaim and to herald something. Timothy was a, a royal herald. Of the written word of God. He was to declare it. He was to be ready to do it. Whatever, whatever time. Whether it was convenient for him. Or whether it was inconvenient. In season and out of season. Whether he felt like it. Whether it was sunny outside. Or whether it was raining. But the scripture and the word of God needed to be. Proclaimed and declared. That even if people didn't respond to it, even if they didn't respond to the truth, that he was to do it with patience and with long suffering. My mind goes back to, to the prophet Jeremiah, who, who probably didn't receive anyone that received his truth, but what was his command? What was his task? It was to, to proclaim the word of the Lord. That even if though people didn't listen and that even though people didn't heed the truth, that he was to proclaim it, to stand upon it, to remind people that this is God's word to them. Romans 10, 13 through 15 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. 
One thing that's for certain and that we see through Scripture is that, that it, must be, it must be proclaimed, it must be spoken of. This is what we're being called to is how can people listen and how can people understand what God's truth is unless somebody tells them. Unless somebody reminds them of the truth of God's word and left, unless somebody shares Jesus with, one, with that person, they won't hear the truth. It is necessary that, that Timothy open his mouth. That he declare the way of the Lord and that he, he speak of the goodness of God and make the path clear. And notice how, how is he to do it? He was to convince and rebuke. This is, uh, this is the negative and the challenging side of, of preaching. The pride of, of man and the pride of our flesh doesn't want to be told what to do. We don't want to be told what is, what is wrong in our way of life. But he was to tell the people of the, of the error of their ways. And show them what God's way is and, and call them to it. The truth and, and the, the reality is that we need, to, we need to hear the truth. We need to know that if we're headed in the wrong direction, that or we're on the wrong path, or if we are in sin, that we... That we're headed towards destruction. This is why the the posture of humility is vital when we're hearing God's word. We allow and we don't allow pride or or anything to, to get in the way from us hearing what God wants us to do and hearing God's word. It's the idea that that we need to be dependent on God's word. We need to be open to its feedback, that we need to understand its instruction, that it's God's way that is always the best way. That we need to admit that we are are sinners and we don't always get it right, but it's God's word that, that holds the test of time and it calls us to the truth. A few years back, I, I dislocated my shoulder and we went, um, while I was snowboarding, and uh, as I was sitting there on the ground looking up, um, all of a sudden I tried to get up, but my arm was like, it was stuck like this, it was dislocated, and so they had to come and bring the, the ski patrol up to come bring me down, so they bring me down, and they, they take me into the, their little uh, area where they, where they treat people who are, uh, who are hurt, and they said, we can't do anything. You actually have to go to the ER to be able to, you know, to, for them to, to look at it and, and for them to get you, uh, get you fixed. So I remember going to the ER and, and I remember they, they looked at me and they knew what they had to do and they actually pulled my arm and put it back into place. I know it sounds kind of painful, but it would be crazy if I were to, what if I went to the, the doctor and they said, you know what, just take a couple of aspirin and, and you'll be all right. No, what what I needed to do is to have my arm put back into place. And it's the same thing with God's Word, that that many times in our life that that we're headed in the wrong direction, that we're relying on our own understanding, and we think we're on the right path. And all of a sudden, when when God's Word speaks to our heart, God convicts our heart and He he makes us known the the path that we need to to be on. He brings us to a place of, of repentance. That if we'll choose to, to understand, if we'll choose to turn to God's way, that, that actually God will give us freedom from our, our error. That God will deliver us from our wrong thinking and put us on the right path headed towards Jesus. That it's God's word that restores us and causes us to look more and more like Jesus when we surrender to it. And we submit our life to it. Timothy needed to endure in teaching and and teach God's word that even when people maybe didn't listen, that he needed to endure and be patient with it 
and to keep calling people back to repentance. H.A. Ironside says it like this, that that is the charge that comes to every one of us if we really know Christ. It is not just for official proclaiming of the word, not just for pastors or elders, but for all Christians. Let us be instant in season and out of season in winning precious souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God is is paramount in our lives. So we can meditate upon it, so we can trust in it, so that we can turn to it. So we need it to be preached and proclaimed. Second lesson is, the third lesson is, don't turn away from the truth. Look at verses 3 through 5. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Why was it important for Timothy to proclaim the truth of God's word? Paul here gives us the the reasons that there would be a time when people would would not want to listen to, to healthy teaching. Sound doctrine. This, this had already started to change even for Timothy. That if you remember in chapter 3 how, Tim, how Paul was giving Timothy the, the description of the times. That they would be dangerous and perilous. People would be lovers of themselves and boasters and proud and unthankful and holy. That this description has, had already been prevalent and it was going to be more and more prevalent for Timothy as he fulfilled his ministry and that he had been entrusted with. We don't have to look too far to realize that it's only gotten worse in our own society. And instead, people, people will will find for themselves people who will, who will tell them what they want to hear. That people would choose for themselves teachers who would, who would tickle their ears and agree with their own ungodly lifestyles. How relevant it is, is it for us even now, this morning, how easy it is for someone to find Someone on the internet, someone to find on, someone on Facebook to, to tell them what they want to hear. That you don't even have to, to phys- physically go into a church this morning. That all you have to do is just open up your phone and find someone who will, who will tell you what you want to hear. Will tell you their opinions and, and say that this is is, is the fact, and this is the reality. We've, we've talked about it before, but there's this, this big push for your truth and my truth. That it's subjective and anything goes. That, that in fact, what we need to hear is, we need to hear what the, the real truth is, and the truth is in God's Word. The truth is objective. This is our our culture and our society now. With the opportunity for this being made more and more available, what is the result is that people will will turn away from the truth. It says in verse 4 that their their ears, their, their ears will be turned away from the truth and they'll instead turn aside and to fables and to myths. That it's only the truth of God's word that, that can open people's eyes. It's what Timothy had been encouraged and exhorted for at the end of chapter 3. Remember, he was to, to continue in the word. Verse 14, and he was, 
And he had been assured and of knowing that from whom you have learned and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise into salvation. This is the, the truth and the reality is that we have the truth of God's word and we have the way of the world. It's only that when we walk in the truth that we're able to experience the, the freedom that is in God's word. John 8, 31 through 32 says, So Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I love that. It says that if you, if you abide in my word, it's not just, it's not just up to us just to, to hear God's word, but we have to respond to it. We have to continue in God's word. We have to treasure it in our hearts. We have to continue in it and meditate on it for God to, to show us the truth that is in it. Verse 5, and, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. It was Tim, Timothy who needed to be alert, Timothy that needed to be ready, Timothy not to be lulled asleep. Timothy wasn't to, to change the message. Or add to it, but he was just to faithfully declare the word of God. Notice it says he was to do the, the work of an evangelist. That Timothy was to take time to, to share the gospel. To share the gospel with, with unbelievers. I heard this before. An evangelist is, is, is essentially a, a shepherd to the unbeliever. He is to proclaim the truth, that he was to show the, the gospel and the good news of Jesus, of what Jesus had did upon the cross, that it was through Christ that we received salvation. And so this was the message and the good news that, that Timothy was to proclaim. He was to proclaim it to those who, who had, had not heard the truth, to those that who, had, who were still far away from a saving relationship with Jesus. This is the, the call for, for every believer to, to proclaim the good news. To show that there is no other name by which we can be saved. So he was to continue in this and to, to share the gospel and not to hold back, but to, to be bold and to proclaim the, the good news of what Christ has done. So we see the, the fourth lesson is to be faithful to the end. He was to live before the presence of God in King Jesus. He was to be ready to proclaim God's word. He was to not turn away from the truth and he was to be faithful to the end. Look at verse 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Paul is, is exhorting Timothy to, to fulfill his ministry. And notice he uses himself as, as, in, as the example. As the example, and he reminds him of, of his life that he's completely given over to the work of Christ and to the proclaiming of, of the good news of Jesus. Verse 6, it, it describes this picture of, of his life was like a drink offering. It was like a drink offering that was being, being poured out. This was the, the final offering that would that would follow the burnt offering and the grain, grain offering that was prescribed for the people of Israel in Numbers 15. In fact, it was a, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So, so Paul describes his life as a here at the end of his life. Sure, surely short, his days were short. 
And he's describing his life and he's describing his, the example of his life to Timothy. Timothy, give your life like this. Spend your life on Christ. Give your life over to Christ. Give it all. It's all, it's all worth it. Paul had, had completely given it to the Lord and, and to the work of Christ. And to the suffering of Jesus, no matter what it costed him. The reason why he was in chains, the reason why he was in, in prison and, and his His time was short and he would come and become a martyr for Christ was because he was faithful to the mission. He was faithful to the the calling that that God had entrusted him with. That was what Paul's life had had been been completely given to. Paul was, was unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's with conviction, with, with not shrinking back, that he was a faithful witness to Jesus. This was, was part of Paul's mindset. Look at this in Philippians 1.21. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But this is what, what consumed Paul. That he would say this to the Philippian church for for me to to live and for me to remain here on earth. It's it's about Christ. It's about him being glorified. It's about his message being proclaimed. And if I die, then it's, it's a gain because I get to be with Christ and I get to see him face to face. But this was his mindset. That above everything else in this world, above all the the things of this life that it was Jesus that mattered. That it was about his message that could actually bring change and can save people from their eternal destiny apart from God. Look what he said in Acts 20, 24, but but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for, for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. The the statistic on everyone's life that we all have a 100% chance of dying. Well, it might seem differently. In fact, people try to, you know, take all these supplements to help them and if you take them, don't, don't fall under condemnation. But it's, it's this fact that we, we're all going to die one day. Whether, before, whether Christ comes and takes us or we, we die in this life, that we must realize that, that we'll all one day have to appear before the Lord. And this is what Paul had in his mind, in his heart. What are we leaving our members and the, our family members with? Are we, we giving them the gospel? Are we giving our life as, as a love and a, a drink offering before the Lord? Here, here Paul was at the end of his life. He had finished his course. And his focus even became even clearer as, he, as he's thinking about, he's about to, to appear before Jesus. And the reality of his life and what, what mattered in his life became even more and more clear to him. And, and here he's calling Timothy to, to also hold on to this. To give his life to, to this. To hold on, to, to spend his life to, to proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Look at verse, verse 8. It says, Finally there is laid up for me the, the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to also to all who have loved his appearing. This is Paul's past, as we've seen, Paul's present and Paul's future. Where is Paul's eyes focused on? He's he's focused on receiving the prize. He's focused on seeing Jesus face to face. 
Paul had, had fought the good fight of faith. Paul had, had stayed the course. But he had not wavered from the truth. And what was his vision and what was his focus? It was on the crown of righteousness that was laid up for him. Warren Rearsby says that the, the crown of righteousness is God's reward for a, a faithful and a righteous life. And our incentive for faithfulness and holiness is the, the promise of the Lord's appearing. Because Paul loved his appearing and loved and looked for it, he lived righteously and served faithfully. This is why Paul used the return of Jesus Christ as a basis for his admonitions in this chapter. Paul was, was looking for the, the return of Christ, whether he was going to meet him as he died and as he gave his, gave his life, or whether he returned at that moment. There's something that is, is purified when we live like this. When we have this in the forefront of our minds that, that Christ could return, that we're going to appear before Jesus. The crown of righteousness is not just for Paul, but it's for all those who have loved his appearing, all those who, who looked for him to return. So I think it's important that we ask, what, is, what does faithfulness look like? Faithfulness is, is keeping Jesus at the center. It's living for him. It's putting him always before us. It's abiding in Him and abiding in His Word in your heart. It's trusting in Him to, to lead you moment by moment. That when you don't know what to do, that instead of trying to figure it out yourself, that, that you go to God and you ask God to, to show you the path that is before you. Hudson Taylor said it like this, this the missionary. It says, it, it's not trying to be faithful, but in looking to the faithful one. That we win the victory. When we continually look at Christ, when we continually make it our aim to, to keep our hearts fixed upon Him, and trusting in His Word and hoping in His Word that, that God is able to, to direct our lives. Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Lay us, let us lay aside every way in the sin which, which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And look at this. How do we do it? Verse 2, looking to Jesus. This is where our, our focus and our attention needs to, to be. The founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the, the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the, the right hand of the throne of God. Love that, that, that it's when we, that it's as Christ knew his mission, that Christ knew that, that he had to go to the cross and he knew that it was through the cross that, that we could have and experience eternal life and it was joy that motivated him. And it's those who are keeping their eyes upon Jesus and are fixing their eyes on Him that, that God actually gives you joy for the race that you're in. To keep our eyes fixed upon Him and to keep trusting in Him. And that's how God works this faithfulness into our life. That we need Him to, to strengthen us. That we need Him to remind us of what a true example looks like. And also the, the grace that He wants to give us in the moment. So we have the, the example of Christ as, as the one who has entered into glory and has conquered the grave. And He's our, our perfect example and He wants to give us strength. And it's the strength that we, we find and the grace that we have because of our union that's in Christ. And this is where, where Paul is admonishing Timothy, hold on to Jesus. Know that, that the end is near, that the end is coming. 
And that as I'm about to appear before him and to receive my crown, may this be your your heart's desire. May you hold on to this. Paul knew who in, in whom he believed in. Paul was living in the, in the presence of Jesus. He knew that, that nothing that he endured in this life was in, was in vain. I love the, the focus that he had. Philippians 3.12 says, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfected, perfect, but I press on to make it known, to make it my own. But Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and and straining forward for what lies ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This was Paul's heart. This was Paul's perspective in life. He was focused on the prize and of seeing Jesus face to face. So concluding the day, what has is, what is God called you to in this life? And are you fulfilling it? Are we faithfully keeping our eyes on Jesus and being faithful to Him? The call that we see is that we're to, to live for Jesus and to, to pour our lives out for Him as a drink offering. It was C.T. Studd, the, the, the British missionary, that said, only one, life will, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will, will last. In eternity, when we appear before the Lord, this is all, everything in this, in this life will, will fade away. What we hold on to our faith and what we've done for Jesus and the gospel that we've shared with one another, that those who have come to Christ, that that's what's going to remain. Friday, our, our family had the opportunity to, to see the Pilgrim's Progress. It's, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't read the book, I'd encourage you all to, to read it, to maybe see it. But through the course of, of his journey, it, 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 it illustrates the, the life of the, of the Christian and the, the perils that they go through and the life that that they experience that he's on this road. And, and I love this picture that it's Jesus that's right beside him. But it's Jesus that's, that's invisible, that he can't see him. And so he endures and he, and he finally makes it to, into heaven. And then all of a sudden Jesus appears before him face to face. And he's filled with, with this eternal joy because he sees Jesus with him. But all throughout the journey that he recognizes that, that it was Christ that was with them all the way. And this is the picture that we have as, as Christians and as followers of Jesus that, that Christ is with us. That Christ wants to see you finish your journey strong. That he wants to, to see you be faithful to the Lord. To endure for him, to, to trust him with your life, to know that there's no, no circumstance that we, we find ourselves in that, that is too much for Christ to handle. But in fact, that when we keep our eyes fixed upon him, that he gives us the strength to keep pressing forward in him. That we hold on to, to God's word and the necessity to, for us to, to preach it and to proclaim it and to hear God's word. And it's God's word that encourages us and strengthens us to keep pressing forward in him. This is the call for, for each and every one of us and the, the hope that we have in Jesus. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Well, we thank you, God, that we are surrounded, God, by such a great cloud of witnesses. Those who have have went before us, examples of Paul and Elijah and Moses, those who were who trusted in you, who trusted in the promise that, that even though they didn't experience the fruition of, of everything, Lord, that they held on to faith, that they trusted in you. And Father, this morning I pray as we examine our lives, as we think about 
our race and each and every one of us, the ministry that you've entrusted to us. God, I pray that we would be faithful. Faithful to trust you. Faithful to, to keep Jesus at the center of our hearts and to, to persevere and to endure and to continue in your word. Lord, I pray for anyone this morning, Lord, who, who doesn't know you. I pray that this morning, God, that they would, or that they would turn to you and trust you and believe you, that they would acknowledge that, Lord, that they're sinners and that they would believe upon you and what you did in Jesus, how you sent him to the cross to die for us, Lord, and that this morning that they, they would confess you as Lord and Savior. So, Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the encouragement of it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.